This episode is brought to you in part by the American Homebrewers Association, a community of more than 40,000 fermentation enthusiasts from around the world. Visit homebrewersassociation.org for recipes, brewing tips, and conversation. homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 19th, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Steve and I sample our first malt sampler. We compare three small batches brewed with Maris Otter, Golden Promise, and Brees Pale Ale malts. Will we be able to discern any differences? Stay tuned. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com. And we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. On St. Patrick's Day, I posted our black lager and corned beef video episode. In this uh, episode, we sampled my black lager fermented with Que Bueno from Imperial Organic Yeast. Man, it was delicious. And we paired it with corned beef, cabbage, carrots, and potatoes from the Instant Pot. Wow. That was a great combination. You can find <laughs> I'm getting hungry. You can find that on our video podcast feed, of course, or on YouTube. Anything happening uh, where you are? Wow. Incredible times we're living through right now. Um, after securing uh, enough food and paper products for our household, including uh, our son, who is now doing his college uh, college classes with the uh, University of Missouri uh, in his room. So, we, you know, we're kind of like University of Missouri at Prairie Grove. Uh, you know, we're, we're hunkered down as much as possible here. Uh, I made a list of the meals that uh, should last us a couple of weeks, and I shopped to fill that list. And uh, luckily, I got most of, uh, you know, I guess most of what we cook or what I cook is is not in high demand. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. But uh, we had very little, little problems uh, getting the items that we needed. And we had meat in the freezer already. So, uh, you know, I think we're in pretty good shape. And I hope you are, too. And I hope uh, that we can all weather this storm well together. Speaking of storms, literal storms, uh, lightning hit our neighbor's house at, at 2.41 this morning. And it uh, shook us out of bed, and uh, I didn't get back to sleep for a long time. So if I sound groggy, uh, I'm not drunk, I swear. Just keeps getting more fun around here. <laughs> um, I'm planning to brew this week. I've got ingredients to do a hoppy and fun uh, pale ale with yeast from our friends and sponsors, Imperial Organic Yeast. I don't think they'd mind uh, my telling you that uh, I, I I have some of uh, next month's seasonal release. Casey sneaked some out early for me. Uh, I'm sworn to secrecy about what it is, but I think that you'll be pleased. Uh, and, and I hope I don't get in trouble telling you that. Imperial is the only producer of organic yeast, and they have the highest pitch rate of any liquid producer, 200 billion cells. I like to say my stir plate is dusty because I don't use starters anymore for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. Im Imperial, you know, they used to package in those neat little cans, but now the yeast comes in easy to open and easy to pour pouches. Uh, Imperial's quality assurance is top-notch, and their customer service is, too. They're just great folks. Uh, the brewers that I've met who have used Imperial Organic Yeast are really impressed by the viability. In fact, the shelf life for a packet of Imperial Yeast has been increased to four months. So check them out at your local homebrew store or go to imperialyeast.com to see what they have to offer. Imperial Organic Yeast. A a loyal sponsor of this podcast, and we appreciate that greatly. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Listener Scott writes, after hearing my conversation with Peter Simons, author of Guile Brews, Scott says, your guest, Peter, mentioned the grain father not being good for party guile brews. 
With a little creativity, I think the ideas and spirit behind Party Guile can be applied using the grandfather. I've dabbled a quad and then a second runnings where I added lots of honey and later some cherries to make up for the lower gravity. Scott says, uh, I use... I uh, used it to expand my brew day by maxing it out on water and or grain weight to make two kinds of beer at once. Sometimes one part goes to my Solera slash Lambic fermenters or gets a fruit or dry or large dry hop addition. Sometimes I will pull some after the mash and make a kettle sour or boil separately on the stove with different hops or spices. Often I use a different yeast, keeping some old equipment around, a kettle, an immersion chiller, small fermenters, has expanded my possibilities and allowed for much more experimentation in smaller batches. Well, thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. I shared Scott's uh, email with uh, Peter, and Peter responded, Grainfather and one-vessel systems generally present more of a challenge for bigger beers and party guiles. I think the biggest issue is is that inherently a one-vessel system is used sequentially for both mashing and boiling, so the party guile brewing sequence of first mash, boil, second mash, boil, then blend, becomes more difficult than using a three-vessel system where you can mash a second time while the first boil is happening. The book has details on how to use a reiterated mashing technique for big celebratory beers, this would also be useful for high-gravity brewing and dilutions, which is another way to party guile. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, Scott did mention that he was using old equipment, so, so, such as a, a kettle, uh, you know, an immersion chiller and smaller fermenters. So, uh, yes, some other secondary boiling would be necessary to brew in the workflow that uh, Peter outlines in the book. And, uh, you know, Steve and I did party guiles using uh, our two... Uh, you know, warthog systems from high gravity. Uh, and uh, once all this stuff blows over, it would be fun to get together with uh, Steve again and, you know, try to brew some of uh, Peter's recipes from his book using our systems again. Uh, these are strange and scary times. If you're, if you're like me, you're pretty much stuck at home, and it just doesn't feel normal. It seems trivial, but, you know, one way I'm feeling more control of my life is to continue brewing, to, to continue, continue making beers. And uh, I'm here at home, you know, might as well brew some great beer. You know I have an electric brewing system from our sponsors, our friends and sponsors at High Gravity in Tulsa, uh, and I love it. No need to worry about trying to find propane. I can let others do that. And if you are truly sequestered nowadays, Desiree and Dave at High Gravity and the rest of the family there can ship your ingredients to you. Using the Build Your Own Beer page on HighGravityBrew.com, it's actually pretty fun. Uh, in one page, you'll find all the ingredients you need to brew amazing beer, and the page keeps a total of how much you've put in your cart and keeps that total visible at all times. And if you want to use this opportunity to upgrade your brewing system... High Gravity has lowered the pricing on their Warthog controllers. You can find standalone controllers along with turnkey systems from High Gravity and other manufacturers. One, two, or three vessel systems from five gallons to two barrels. And if you use the code EBC75BB, that's EBC75BB, you can save an additional 75 bucks. So close that browser window with all the bad news and open a new one at highgravitybrew.com. And if I can borrow a phrase from Charlie, relax, don't worry, brew a homebrew. Highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's go back in time when people could, you know, stand close to each other or sit close to each other and talk to you. <laughs> and uh, go back with uh, Steve Wilkes and I as we sample the very first Malt Sampler. Well, Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. We're starting out at a new adventure today. We are indeed. <laughs> These are, we're used to doing the hop samplers, mm -hmm. but uh, I got an email a long time ago from Chris McKenzie, who has been on this very program a couple times in the past. He has a website called the Brew You Blog, that's B-R-E-W-U, blog, B-L-O-G, dot com. 
and he said, uh, you know, I'm enjoying the uh, the hop samplers. At least I remember him saying that he was enjoying the hop samplers. I <laughs> but he said, uh, I would like to ha- to for you guys to try to do a malt sampler series. And he suggested and sent a link to the hot steep method, which is on the Brees uh, website. And you and I have tried, if not that method, something similar in the past where you just take uh, malt and you mill it and then you steep it in hot, hot water and then you you do essentially evaluation on that. So, you you know, you taste this uh, and you refer to it as, as grain tea yeah. uh, in, the, in the past. And we really weren't so happy with that with that method. No, because it, you don't really get a full sense of what the grain's going to do in a more realistic or more real world situation. So we've we've taken it <laughs> just like the eagles. We took it to the limit. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we. I mean, you know, you do get a, an impression of of what the grains are, right. but there's but beer is so much more than just hop tea. Uh, right. I mean, there's the alcohol, there's the hops, you know, there's the, the fermentation characteristic of yeast. There's all this stuff that goes into uh, a beer rather than just steeping grain in water. Right. So what you did was you, you actually brewed the beer. I actually brewed some beer. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this takes more dedication than the, the hop sampler, which the hop sampler, you can turn around a you know, a six pack brewing time in an hour, you know, with, and maybe less than that now that I'm only uh, steeping for 10 minutes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to do all grain batches of, of beer. And so the turnaround time on each of these was two and a half hours from doughing in to pitching the yeast. It's like two and a half hours to get a, a six packs worth of beer. Which you know, if you're looking at the general scheme of things, if you're if you're wanting to be a production brewery, that's not the <laughs> right. that's not the way to make a buck. <laughs> <laughs> but in a day's time, you know, you can turn around three of these batches of beer and and um, and have something that's that's worth uh, sampling. That's right. And so we chose for the first edition of this to go with three base grains. So we decided to try three pale ale malts, and we chose a crisp Maris Otter, Simpson's Golden Promise, and Brees Pale Ale Malt. Mm-hmm. So we've got three pale ale malts, essentially, and uh, we wanted to see how they, well, you know, compare and contrast. And you suggested those three. Um, why did you suggest those particular ones? Uh, well, you know, because they're so similar they can be used essentially interchangeably. Now, I know that somebody out there is going to say, oh, no, you can't. <laughs> but they're, they're, pale, they're pale ale malt. They can be used on a wide range of beers. And, you know, Maris Otter and Golden Promise, well, Golden Promise is the Scottish iteration of Maris Otter and vice versa. And then Brees's, a pale ale malt would be what you would use. It's just, say you went to a homebrew store and the recipe called for Maris Otter, but they just had Brees Pale. Well, that's what you'd use. It's, it's a, they're pretty much the same malt, mm. though a little bit of difference between the three. And, we, and I was just curious to see, frankly, for my own edification about what the differences would be. I've used all three of these malts any number of times over the years, but I've never had them side by side. And I've certainly never had them in isolation before. So I thought it would be fun to try and a good a good pairing of these, much better than say pairing against Pilsner and mm-hmm. Two Row and Munich. Say that yeah. you know you don't really get a sense of why you would choose one or the, over the other. But these, I thought, would give us a really good uh, benchmark against the three against each other. So similar utility, similar uses, but uh, some people have preferences uh, one over the other, and so just a kind of a way to feel that out and see. You know these malts are are used similarly enough that you know do, does it really make a difference between the three? Yeah, for sure. And you know, and and it's fun if if you go to your you know local homebrew store, and I hope you do. Uh, you reach into the bins and you and you can 
you know, sneak a few grains of the uh, mm-hmm. of kernels of, of malt and you chase it. Do you know, have you done a side by side crunching of the of the malts to see if they if they taste different, you know, straight out of the grain bin? Oh, sure. Usually I put sugar and milk on them. Uh, <laughs> That's breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> cut a banana up and I'm home free for the day. And it also keeps me regular. But uh, That's the husks. That's a, yeah. <laughs> That's your filter bed. That's right. <laughs> You don't want to see me Vorloff, though. <laughs> I'll tell you. At any rate, um, <laughs> yes, I, yeah, sure I do. And I encourage my customers to do it, too. I always try to get them to check it out, you know, and see see what they taste like and, and see if they can taste a difference between the three, or in this case, between the three. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, well, it's, you know, kind of see what you're getting. And and um, and there is some difference, you know, when you when you taste – if you just take a few grains of any one of these three and kind of crunch them, there's a little bit of difference between the three. Now, uh, I guess we should talk about my my recipe for this uh, for this batch. So I wanted to I wanted to have a, a six pack at the end of the process, and I wanted to ferment in a one gallon jug. So here's what I did: I took five quarts or four point seven liters of water. And I used brew in a bag. So I put uh, in my kettle, I put my bag <laughs> and I put five quarts or 4.7 liters of water at 164 degrees Fahrenheit or 73 C. And into that, I put two pounds or around 900 grams of, of each of these base malts for each batch. So I did this three separate times. Yeah. So that brought me to a mash rest temperature of 152 degrees Fahrenheit or 66.7 C and I had preheated my oven to around 150 degrees Fahrenheit so that I could put this since it's such a small uh, 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 oh what's the term what's the physics term thermal volume thermal mass since a small uh, thermal mass uh, you know, it's not going to stay that temperature for very long. So I, I, in keeping it in the oven at that preheated temperature, it does maintain the proper mash temperature. So I, I mashed uh, for an hour. And then after that hour, I took the bag out, collected my wort, and boiled for 30 minutes. And at the beginning of that 30-minute boil, I did 9 grams of French spalt at 1.7% alpha acid. And we chose that because of the low alpha acid. Um, And I boiled for 30 minutes. After that 30 minutes, I I chilled it in an ice bath, and that took around 11 or 12 minutes per batch. Uh, And then I transferred from the kettle to my uh, one-gallon jug and pitched three grams of Safale US05. Now... um, so, so is that is that clear? Is that did I did I skip anything? I don't think so. <laughs> so it's just a small batch, you know, yeah. thir- thirty minute boil, but a full one hour mash because I wanted to get, you know, that's where the the malt is going to shine. That's the right. malt's job, right? So yeah, and here we have three beers that are very similar in mm-hmm. color. However, there's a l- slight difference in the. Um, in the coloration of the three beers, I think. Mm-hmm. So, so, so I guess I, I guess I should give these stats. Of oh the, yeah. Um, the Golden Promise, the pre-boil volume was, and I measured pre-fermentation uh, gravity with a refractometer and converted, and then the post-fermentation I measured with a hydrometer. So the Golden Promise started out at thirteen bricks or ten fifty one. Uh, pre-boil, the original gravity after the 30-minute boil was 17.2 or 10.69. And then the Golden Promise finished at 10.12 for an ABV of 7.6%. The Maris Otter started out at 13, which is 10.51. Original gravity, 17.1, which was 10.68, which is just a, you know, just a hair different from the uh, yeah. from after the boil, yeah. but that's just a an artifact of you know maybe there was a breeze blowing through the <laughs> right. through the kitchen, uh, and then the finishing gravity was ten eleven, so uh, for an ABV of seven point six percent. 
the Brees Pale Malt started out again, pre boil volume 13 or 1051, original gravity of 17.5. So the boil was, I guess, a teeny bit more vigorous for that one. So the original gravity was 1070. Still, it finished out at 1012 uh, at uh, an ABV of 7.7%. So I was kind of wow. struck at how similar their performance you know, gravity-wise and efficiency-wise of all three of these were. They were just right, you know, within margin of error uh, uh, between each other. Absolutely. And again, that reinforces the interchangeability of the three malts. Mm. Um, Well, I'm surprised, too, at at how much alike they are as far as their statistical. Yeah, Yeah. I, I was expecting one to be an outlier for some reason. I don't know why. Huh. Uh, but they but they are different varieties of, of of grain, or at least you know at least two different varieties. Uh, but they, according to you know, and I ran them through my grain mill at home. Yeah. Uh, and so they they all have the same process, the same water, the same pot, the same temperatures, and everything, and they all they all perform pretty much just alike. That's pretty cool. I like that. Okay. So now we got all the, um, you know, I got my brewer's logbook here in front of me. So now I got all the stats that we pulled from the brewer's logbook. Other than uh, I brewed on January 31st and we, I kegged on or uh, bottled on uh, the uh, February 11th. So, so it's been a while since it's been about a month. These have been in the bottle. Um, So uh, we have, and what I did was I bottled and primed with a carbonation drop, Cooper's carbonation drop per bottle. Uh, and we have randomized them. We've got mm-hmm. uh, duct tape on the on the lids. We've poured them into cups. We don't know which is which. And they're sitting out in front of us. And you were mentioning the color. There is a, there is a color difference. What is your impression of the... <laughs> what's your... <laughs> how would you characterize the... <laughs> how would you characterize the color difference between the three? I I think that uh, the beer that we've tagged as number one is the lightest in color, and number two and three I think are very very similar. But if I had to if I had to pick, I'd say the number three is a little bit darker mm-hmm. than two. So one, two, and three, and ever so slightly, and I mean ever so slightly mm-hmm. darker from light to dark in one, two, three, um, and that makes sense because the stats for these three beers uh i mean these three malts um and we'll go over this in more depth but the breeze pale is uh 3.5 love a bond the golden promise is 2.2 to 3 and the maris otter is 2.5 to 3.5 so they're going to come in almost exactly the same and of course the vigorousness the vigorousness of the boil is going to matter there's a lot of variables that are going to contribute to the the final color of the beer so you can't bark up that tree too much but um so they're very very close in color but nonetheless to my eyes number one is is a little bit lighter in color than number three and i'll post a photo on instagram and and twitter uh but yeah yeah i would i would go with you number three is more more dark than the other two one and two are more similar than than number three yeah in my opinion yeah and since the since the numbers came out so so closely, I wouldn't think that boil vigor would be the cause of that. No, I wouldn't either. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now we got we got beer number one. Now comes the sensory, and we've been sitting and sitting and talking and jawing, and it's cooled down a little bit. First of all, how would you characterize the recipe? I mean, I think, or well, how would you characterize the hopping and the and the recipe and and just how how it came out? Well, I think pretty good. I mean, it's a actually not a bad little smash beer as far as it goes. I mean, uh, they all taste pretty good. Um, very simple little beer. Number one is nice. It's that's the one that we're on. It's um, a little. It's the sweetest. It's 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 got some sweetness to it, and the finish is is a little bit longer on the palate to me um, than the other two. The hop character in all three of these is about right. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not in your face, but it's definitely there. Um, so I think that our our spalt uh, choice was good, and um, 
you know, we didn't pick one that kind of overwhelmed the the malt. We didn't want to do that. So I think we did a good job in choosing that particular hop. And uh, I think the way you brewed them is good. I'm, I'm glad that you did this. Well, you had to do this as an all grain beer, right. for sure. But but I like the way that you did it, and I I think it it gives a good example of how the how the malt will perform. Do you think it tastes? <clears throat> do you think that these as a whole taste more sort of grainy than the extract beers that I've been doing? I mean, could you could you taste these side by side? Could you pick these out? Do you think in in a in a sampling of uh, of you know between these and typical or typical hop sampler beers? Could you taste you know taste these and say, oh yeah, this is an all grain beer? You know, I don't know that, and I'll tell you why. Because the the in terms of the hop sampler beers, those are all brewed with Pilsner malt, and so they're much lighter. Oh. And uh, the one thing I can say is that even though it's Pilsner malt and it is malt extract, I know that it was very fresh malt extract, mm. and fresh malt extract it's pretty darn hard to tell from grain. Old malt extract has got a little wang to it, so you, so that's 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 a true thing. But if you're working with good quality fresh ingredients, it's pretty hard to tell the difference. So what I would say is, if we had an opportunity to uh, say brew with a pound of Brees Pale, which is what I would get, what I would carry, um, and just brew up a six pack of Brees Pale malt, uh, you know, extract. I, I don't know whether we could tell a difference or not. That would be an interesting thing to find out. That's a good point. Uh, I think that these taste nice and fresh. Yeah. Uh, and I think they taste like beer. And I don't think that the, I think the the hop sampler beers are also good beers. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that's a good point. It's when you, uh, especially when you, uh, you know, you start with, uh, uh, and we haven't done any hop samplers with liquid malt extract, but if you, if you have fresh extract, uh, it's going to taste like beer. It's going to taste, you know, yeah. you taste the grain, and it's not going to taste stale, and it's not going to, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it's not going to taste oxidized. It's it's uh, easier for a liquid malt extract, as I understand it, to get oxidized more than a dry, uh, and that makes sense. But yeah, so I think that you're right that these have a little more character than than the typical hop extract yep. but that's a good that's a really good point in that we are using in that recipe a pilsner light malt extract yeah completely different malt mm-hmm. so that that's not yeah that wouldn't be a fair comparison but but um so yeah these taste well they just taste fresh and good i mean i don't mm-hmm. you know the all three beers are brewed well there's nothing wrong with them um yeah number one to me um i think the hops to me come across as a little bit floral Mm -hmm. but they're not overwhelming it's just Mm -hmm. nice a nice um nice bitterness and just a little nice floral characteristic i don't know that it's enough to mask anything uh number one to me has a nice really nice kind of sweet maltiness to it um that Is a little bit, just a teeny bit caramel. Mm. You know, it's not it's not <clears throat> super sweet or super. It's not like sucking on a piece of candy, but but there is a nice kind of caramel or caramel backbone there. Yeah, I th- I find that this beer is of of the three. I find it to be the lightest, the most floral. That's a good word. Um, almost herbal, and of course, that's going to go to the hop. But um, and then it has the longest finish, and I think that's mm. it, it finishes long, and so a little a little sweeter in the palate uh, to me. And um, it's very nice. It has kind of a round finish, mm. as far as when I when I taste it, it doesn't finish dry. It finishes kind of wet mm. in a way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's let's read the first okay. uh, randomly selected uh, descriptor. All right. So the first one, in no particular order, is Maris Otter, and this happens to be Crisp Maris Otter. Uh, Crisp Maris Otter is an English ale. This is the official from Crisp, by the way. 
Crisp Maris Otter is an English ale-style malt made from the famous Maris Otter barley variety. English Maris Otter is recognized worldwide as the benchmark barley for the best ale malt. That's a little editorial. <laughs> this is marketing copy. This is marketing copy, by the way. So take that with a grain of malt. Um, harvest to harvest. <laughs> I like Marisol. Mar- You'll turn into a pillar of malt. That's right. <laughs> Same speaker. Um, Marisol produces a consistent, flavorful base malt. Uh, the low protein content and high degree of modification are considered ideal by expert ale brewers and are very forg- and are very forgiving to the novice when mashed. A classic high quality choice for English ales, Maris Otter, Maris Otter is also used as a base malt for continental and American ales and occasionally lockers. Hmm. So not much on the flavor characteristics. No, they don't usually give you a lot. And I and you know I wonder <laughs> about that because uh, we're going to find that with the other descriptions as well, because these are relatively neutral. I mean, mm. they're not, they are they are more um, flavorful than Pilsner or standard two-row malt, but they're still fairly neutral palates. They're fairly blank slates. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, you know, Special B or, you know, Black Patent or something. Where there's a whole lot to say about the, the flavor right. profile of it. Right. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Good point. Okay, beer number two. Number two. I think it's a little more a little more flavorful than number. Let me go back and taste number one. I think I'm getting a, a teeny bit more of that kind of caramel mm-hmm. out of number two. I do too. I think it's a little more flavorful, and I think that it finishes a little drier. So I get a little bit more of a uh, toasted bread flavor from it. Just a little bit of light toasted bread or bread crust, maybe. and uh, But just a little bit. Not as much as putting a bunch of biscuit malt in, but just a little bit. Mm. And I also think the beer finishes a little drier. Mm. It, it seems like it finishes a little... Clean isn't the right word because that implies something else, I think. But... But it's a little when it finishes when I've when I've swallowed it and I'm done drinking it, my palate seems to be cleaner. Hmm. Um, and I wonder if that's because well, I don't I don't really know why it is, but it, but it just is compared to number one. Yeah, it's interesting because it's got more flavor than number one. But I think you're right that it does it does get out of the way uh-huh. uh, after the swallow, whereas number one is sort of lighter flavored but that flavor kind of lingers longer yeah it, yeah it really does it's, it sticks around a little bit more yeah number two is more more complex yeah I, oh yeah oh it really does pay to let beers warm up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you're tasting them yeah because in the beginning i was like ah, i'm not getting anything different from any of these but then you know once we've been jawing for 20 minutes whatever um hmm that's my favorite so far, I have to say. Yeah, it's it's really it's really nice. I like the it is a little bit more complex and I think it stands up at least in, in this recipe, it stands up better on its own. Mm. Um as far as a, a smash beer in the recipe that you did, I think this is a better beer. Mm. Not not by a lot though. I mean I, yeah. I don't want to put any of these down because they're all really nice and tasty. But um but I like the I like that little bit of of uh, little breadiness in this one better. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. Random descriptor number two. <clears throat> number two. This is the description for Golden Promise, which is malted by the Simpson Malt House. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Oakley, Oakley. Uh, Simpson's finest pale ale, Golden Promise, pale malt. Made from the, oh boy, made from the epi, eponomy, <laughs> I'm not even going to say that word. Made from spring barley variety <laughs> is a UK classic. Historically, the Scottish analog to English Maris Otter malts, comma. Golden Promise is well used in any English or Scottish style ale. The sweet, robust malt flavor of Golden Promise has also made it a choice for base malt for American IPAs, lagers, and several famous whiskies. Hmm. And we also learned uh, from the article that uh, uh, Mike Tonsmeyer posted uh, the other day that Golden Promise 
was one of these plants that came out of the 60s where they pelted them with radiation <laughs> with gamma rays and they caused mutations and Goodness. some of them some of them worked and some of them didn't uh, so this is like a you know golden promises like this incredible hulk of <laughs> of malts uh and uh the comment that tons that mike made on the on the uh on the twitter was that he thought that that golden promise was an heirloom variety that had been around forever but it turns out it was created in a lab in the 60s so <laughs> that's great <laughs> i could see why they wouldn't want to put that in the marketing copy but uh <laughs> Unless, uh, unless you're a Marvel fan, <laughs> yeah. be green with envy. Well, I use I use Golden Promise. I like Golden Promise. I've I've brewed with it for years and years. Um, when I ran across it, and um, I actually use it in my um, Munich Helles beers. Huh. And I like it. I like it in in that in those lager beers. So I like it that it adds just a little kind of sweetness and softness to the beer that. I find in that style of beer. A little something extra. Yeah. All All right. right. Sample number three, and this is the darkest of the three. Right. You go first this time. Well, for my palate, this one kind of strikes the middle between number one and number two in terms of how it finishes and the overall flavor profile that I get from it. In other words... It doesn't finish as long and as sweet as number one, but it's not quite as crisp or as nutty or toasty as number two. Did I say that right? As number two, yeah. And so, um, but I like it quite well. It, I expected it to be a little bit more nutty than it is. It's very soft. Mm-hmm. The beer is really soft. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't have that kind of... Um, crisp finish that number two has soft is an adjective that i was going to use also i think it i think it accentuates the hops i get more of either that or or it has the flavors that i that i'm associating with hops it has more of a fruity uh flavorful uh floral yes character to it Mm -hmm. it's just it's just it tastes more than the other two. <laughs> there's more flavor component. There's it's deeper and and there's a whole lot more going on as far as the flavor components. And I'm not sure if that is. I mean, some of it's got to got to be coming from the malt. I think it's got to be. Well, it's interesting because it, it it's it certainly is different than the other two. Hmm. Um, and I kind of agree with you. I think it might be the most complex of the three because it it. It pulls from the other two in terms of its flavor uh, profile. Um, it doesn't finish as dry and crisp as number two, and I I kind of wish it did. But but on the other hand, it 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 has that nice hop profile, that nice hop character, fruity, elegant, round, filling. Uh, you know when you when you taste it, kind of all your taste buds are engaged. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's nice, and that's um, that's pretty darn good. That's 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 what yeah. you want. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and that's that's pretty. That's I don't know. I'm losing my ability to be articulate here because <laughs> I'm just kind of out of words, you know. But but it, it's a it's a very nice beer, and wow, wow, yeah. That's the most, I guess, satisfying of the three. To me, because just there's a whole bunch of flavor, um, and I hate to be so generic, but but it's just it's just it's just firing on a whole lot more receptors to me than the other two. It's more three dimensional. It's not necessarily more caramely, but I think it is sort of more malty to use yet another generic term. But but it is sort of more grainy but at the same time accentuating the the character of that uh, french stressel spalt well i think that i think that what it does the best of the three is that it integrates the flavor of the hop and the malt yeah it you really get a you really get both of those flavors and all their complexity coming at you all at once and it does a really good job of that but i would i would disagree with you 
in the sense of which one you, I like best. And there's, yeah. I, I like number two the best. Oh, okay. I, I still, it's still my favorite. I really like the, uh, the nuttiness or the toastiness. I haven't decided what I want to call that, but I, I really like the way that that malt expresses itself. And I really like the clean, uh, kind of crisp and dry finish that that beer has. So that's my favorite of, of the three. I also want to say that they're all three good beers. Yeah. And if we put 20 brewers in this room, I'm sure there would be 25 different um, opinions about which one's best. Okay. I just went back and, and sampled all three again. Number one, I would say, is clean and floral. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just like the malt sort of gets out of the way, and the and the crisp, clean, floral character of that hop comes through. Yeah. And it's kind of more one-dimensional. Number two adds kind of a caramely uh, character uh, to that. Bready, bready is good. I like that toasty bready uh, descriptor as well. That's good. But then number three is um, sort of sweet without being cloying because the, the flavor goes away pretty quickly. But then that hop character is on the, on top of it. So they are three, they're, they are all three different. Yeah. They're, they're really different. So let's, let's hear the last descriptor. And this is going to be for the Brees pale malt and they don't say a whole lot about it. And again, this came off their website, of course, the actual, their official language. So it says slightly, slightly darker than their regular 1928 two row brewers malt, and, and it is uh, typical color, 3.5 flavor, and flavor contributions are warm and malty, oh, and yeah. and that's true. Uh, there may be some other language in their data sheets that I didn't pick up, but um, yeah. So so there you go. There you go. Huh. Well, do you do you have? Uh... <laughs> Do you have a guess? I have a guess, but I I don't have any confidence in it. But I have a guess, and I'm okay. What maybe we can take turns? What What do you think's number one? I think number one is Golden Promise. Oh, interesting. I, I'm thinking uh, number one is Brees uh, Pale. Okay. Number two, I think, is Golden Promise. I think number two is Brees Pale. <laughs> <laughs> so we're agreed. That number three is, is Maris Otter. Yes. And again, I have no confidence in my <laughs> none. But that's what I think. Okay. Right. Here we go. This is gonna be number great. number well, one. Let's... Should we go to number one? Okay. Number one I said was, was Breeze Pale. You said was Golden Promise. Yes. And it is... Golden Promise. Golden Promise. You're right on that one. All right. All right. One for one. Okay. Number two... I said it was Brees Pale. You said it was Golden Gold Promise. Promise. We know I'm so, wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> it's Maris oh, Otter. it's Maris Otter. Okay, so I'll be darned. There you go. Huh? Interesting. So number three is Brees Brees Pale. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's stunning. I got no. I got none right. You got none right, <laughs> but you got one right. Yeah, but but that's okay. But that's based on again. It's based on descriptions. Yeah, from from the manufacturers. You know, just like in the hop sampler, we we're, we're relying on descriptions somebody else wrote about these these products. Huh. Well, what do you know about that? I I don't. I'm I am um, I am not surprised. I you know I I was. I was pretty confident about the Golden Promise. I wasn't confident about the Marisol or the Breeze. I kind of, I'll tell you why I thought that the Breeze was number two, because when you, when you eat them, the Breeze seems to be the drier or the, huh. the less sweet between the two when I, when I sampled them just tasting. So I thought, well, okay, that, that beer seems to be a little drier to me, so I'll call that the, huh. the Breeze, but, but I was wrong. Wow. Interesting and and pretty cool that they they really did exhibit a little bit different characteristic. Of course, you're not going to brew this beer. I mean, you know, as, as a, well, you might <laughs> actually. <laughs> it's not a bad beer. 
But uh, huh. wow. Well, the, I got to say that the that the Reese Pale Malt had a lot more character than I than I. Uh, that's the my that's my big surprise is that. I kind of I don't know why, but I kind of expected it to be the kind of more generic. Of the, of the well, three. because it's the least exotic. Yeah, I mean, you know, really. Yeah, it's it's the one that's closest to home, but it really brought the most of the party. Mm-hmm. Pretty much, hands in, down. In, in this style, in this experiment, on yeah. that day that I brewed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> on, this, on this day that we're tasting. Yeah, yeah. So you can't. Yeah, but um, hmm. all three made an interesting beer, and wow, that's pretty cool. I have no idea what to do with any of this information. <laughs> I mean, because I would still well, brew, you know, I still, I wouldn't not brew a beer with any of these or, I, you but, know. But, but, I, and, and what are the, what are the price point on all of the, you know, what, what's, well, what's I mean, the, if, you, if price comes into it, then yeah, because the Breeze Pale is about 10 or 12 cents a pound cheaper. Uh, so, you know. Actually, no. Actually, it's more than that, because the uh, these are two and a half dollars a pound. The the UK malts are two two forty nine a pound, and the Breeze is two as a dollar fifty three a pound. Uh, so yeah, so it's a lot less expensive, and it actually brought quite a bit to the party. Yeah. Um, hmm. I we, we're use, not sponsored by Breeze in any way. No, we're not. And you, you know, sell their product. I sell all three of them. <laughs> I like all three. Like I say, I, now I say I would still use. I really like the Golden Promise in that Hella Spear, and I use it because it's light, and because it leaves has a lingering finish, or at least I think it does. And that, and that's what I got out of this beer. Yeah, so I like a, it for that. I mean, that's a good point. If you if you wanted a, if you wanted a really delicate beer, uh, the Golden Promise would would be an excellent source. And I think a Hellas made with the Golden Promise would be superior. Than a Hellas made with the with the breeze pale. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think even and I think for my palate and for my, with my reasoning, superior to making it with Pilsner malt or with two row malt, because I kind of wanted a little bit something a little bit more expressive, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to resort to trying to doctor it with crystally malts. I'm kind of of the Casey Latelier. Yeah, simple, school simple simple grain bill. So trying to find a, a a base malt that kind of brings everything I want to that beer, and I thought Golden Promise would work well, and it does mm-hmm. for that. So now, if I wanted to make a truly authentic, quote unquote, um, you know, British pub ale, maybe the Maris Otter. Would be yep. the way to go because it brings a little caramel to the thing without being overpowering yep. and slapping you in the face with here. I'm, I'm, you know, this malt. Yeah, but I still, but again, I still wouldn't hesitate to use any one of the other two. Hmm. I, I, I just wouldn't hesitate to not do that. But yeah, I mean, you know, all things considered, I probably use Marisotter first for that. For an American IPA, you know, an American style pale, I'd probably use the Breeze first. Uh, but I wouldn't worry about. It. I wouldn't get my myself all tied up in knots yeah you know if i walked into not just my store but anybody's store you know wherever you are in the country and if they've got you know marisol are great if they if they've got breeze or somebody else's american pale that's great too Mm -hmm. they'll they'll definitely work um you just don't want to you know you don't want to you know a guy came in the other day who was he was buying extra extracts but he bought a 10 pound bag of midnight wheat and i was like what are you gonna do with what that? What are you gonna do with that? I I, <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him it wasn't gonna do anything. <laughs> That's gonna last you a while. <laughs> I don't know what was going on there. But you know <laughs> Well you you educate and they decide. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you arm them with the facts and they do whatever they want to with it. <laughs> no, but I think I think that uh, like a hoppy uh like a hoppy pale ale, I think that that, that breeze pale ale malt would be really tasty yeah it really it really popped those hops without anything extra going on yeah and for a dry english you know something that's not going to be all about hops the Mar- you know it's kind of like the the malt performed the way that they're supposed to perform for the kind of beers that you associate with them yeah which is very interesting yeah huh well there you go i'm 
I was kind of worried, you know, the, the, this first in the series, I was kind of worried, you know, that we wouldn't have enough to talk about or they, yeah. they'd taste too similar and, you know, but no, that's, that's just, I think it turned out good. Your your mileage may vary out there, uh, <laughs> but try it yourself. Um, I think that this was fun. I think I can't wait till the next one, and uh, we, you know we'll have to get together at your at your shop, Steve's Brew Shop dot com, and uh, pick out what the what the next round will be. This is this is fun. Yeah. All right, Steve. All right, James. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, thanks again to Steve Wilkes of Steve's Brew Shop. Dot com. That was fun. I'm looking forward to the next uh, malt sampler. And, uh, you know, you can check out Steve's store at stevesbrewshop.com. And uh, if you, especially if you're in the northwest Arkansas area, you can order online and pay ahead of time and then uh, check the pickup box. So you can just uh, run by and, uh, and pick up your stuff uh, so you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, out in the public. So, uh, we hope that everybody's doing well, and we hope that uh, everybody uh, can, can make use of their time in, with their family, sequestered away from everybody else, if you can do that. And many thanks to everybody who are working out there who have to get out uh, and uh, be in the public and, and provide services that uh, we couldn't do without. So. Cheers to everybody, and, and stay safe and stay well. And we'll talk to you next week. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. That's all until next time. Until then. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>